I knew things had changed when Ronnie Stetzer came back to town. He was at one time my wife's fiance, Cindy. Ronnie had broken up with Cindy a year before I met her. She made no secret of the fact that Ronnie had broken her heart when he decided to break up with her and marry a rich woman ten years older. I started dating Cindy. She didn't have the great looks of a model or movie star, but she was very pretty. She had soft brown hair and brown eyes and a beautiful face, but it was her loving heart that drew me to her. We were married about a year later, and our little girl Amanda was born nine months later. Life was good for 18 of our 19 years together. We had our disagreements, but nothing serious until recently. Usually, our disagreements came when we shared responsibilities. Cindy was the only child in the family and was spoiled by her parents. Over the years, however, she learned to keep her stubbornness in check. When our daughter was born, Amanda became my little princess. We were especially close, and our family was very friendly. However, over the last year, Cindy and I seemed to be drifting apart. I began to realize that we were doing less and less together. However, our lovemaking was very good, and we did it at least twice a week and more often than that. Cindy seemed happiest when we were cuddling. I knew she loved me deeply. I still loved Cindy, but in a different way. It was no longer like the hot, passionate love we had felt when we were first married. We were like two old shoes that had known better days, but fit together well. Still, I loved my wife very much and especially loved the life we had built. When Amanda graduated from high school, the changes in Cindy seemed to accelerate. She seemed to be on the verge of a breakdown, and the closer it got to the time when Amanda would leave for college, the more uncomfortable Cindy became. I was now the chief of detectives for the sheriff's department, and I had 32 detectives under me. Since this county wasn't a high-crime county, the job wasn't too stressful. Cindy was still working as a dental hygienist. About a month after Amanda left for college, Ronnie showed up at a barbecue thrown by a couple, John and Ann Smythe, who were more Cindy's friends than mine. Nevertheless, John and I got along just fine, since he owned a security company, and we always had a lot to talk about. I had no idea Ronnie would be there, but Cindy certainly did. She immediately pulled away from me, which wasn't unusual, and started circling. But an hour later, I went looking for her and found her and Ronnie sitting on the porch. As I approached, Cindy's neck was slightly flushed, which meant she was up to something I wasn't going to like. She quickly introduced me to Ronnie and my stomach clenched. As a cop, I had developed an inner instinct, and mine told me this was real trouble. Cindy tried to brush it off like she was surprised to see him, and they were just reminiscing about old times. But her neck turned red during the explanation. I decided I wasn't going to blow this whole thing out of proportion. As a police officer, I deal with extremely unpleasant situations many times. Nevertheless, it is necessary to handle them in a calm and professional manner. Sometimes that can be very difficult. The next working day after the barbecue, I checked on Ronnie through my channels. I learned that his wife had died of cancer a year ago. In all those years, Ronnie hadn't even had a speeding ticket, let alone other problems with the police. As the months went by, we saw Ronnie more and more often. I knew this was no accident, so I began to prepare for the worst. I figured that any day now Cindy would want to talk to me about something. But as prepared as I was, Cindy blew me out of the water when she decided to do it. We had just finished a rare morning lovemaking session, and I thought that maybe all my worries had been for nothing. It was clear to me that Cindy still loved me as much as ever. Ted, I want to talk to you about something, she said nervously, and I don't want you to be angry. I want you to let me finish before you say anything. My stomach flipped. You know Ronnie was my first love, she explained. We were engaged. Then he fell in love with Catherine, and we broke up. After his wife died, he was devastated. He's so lonely. He tells me he still loves me, and I have to admit I still love him. But at the same time, I love you. I didn't say a word and tried my best to control my breathing and stay calm. That gave Cindy courage because she smiled and continued. I still want to be your wife, but I want to be with Ronnie too. Ronnie and I talked it over and decided it would be fair for me to stay with you for a week and him for a week. I slipped out of bed, got dressed, and left without a word. I headed to my office and closed the door. The receptionist looked at my unshaven face but didn't ask. I told her I didn't want to be disturbed unless it was something serious. I was left alone. 
I sat in the unlit office for hours. I went over and over in my head the proposal my wife had made to me. It was the most selfish thing she could have done. It was clear to me that Cindy wanted to sit on two chairs. That can't happen. She would have to choose. Around five o'clock, I got home. I was really annoyed when I saw Ronnie's car in the driveway. I tried to pull myself together and use all my years of police training to stay calm. However, all that training didn't prepare me for anything like this. I found them in the living room sitting nervously. Cindy quickly stood up and walked over to me to kiss me. I pushed her away and saw that she was in pain. But I didn't care. We need to talk about this, Cindy said nervously. We don't have anything to talk about, I replied shortly. You either want to be with the asshole or you want to be with me. You can't have him and me. I don't think you fully thought this proposal through, Ronnie said, looking at me nervously. I'm not going to take your wife away from you. I'm just going to give her the extra love she needs. Yes, we'll share her, but she'll never miss any of her marital obligations. Now my inner rage was almost on the verge of boiling over. That smug bastard had just told me that I should let Cindy sleep with him because she needed the extra love. They both made me cringe. And in that moment, I realized my marriage was over. Except, I said, looking fiercely at Ronnie, the marital duty of giving up all the others. No, I'm not going to agree to that. Ted, Cindy said with an expression that told me she was now upset with me. It's going to happen. The question is whether or not you're going to be a part of it. No, I said. Both of you leave. Cindy burst into tears. Ted, please give me this. I've been a faithful wife all these years. Ronnie was my first love, but I don't want to lose you. I love you so much, but I love Ronnie too. I snorted and looked at Ronnie. Tell me, Ronnie, if your late wife had come to you with a similar offer, would you have accepted it? He smiled at me and nodded. If it could make my wife happy, I'd gladly accept it. Bullshit, I said with more force than I meant to. But I wanted to follow through with my thoughts, so I turned to Cindy. What about you, Cindy? If I came home with an ex-girlfriend and told you I wanted you to share me with her, how would you feel about that? Cindy hesitated for a few seconds before answering. I'd probably be upset like you are right now, but in the end I'd agree, because I really love you and want you to be happy. More bullshit. I said, shaking my head. I'm going to contact my lawyer in the morning to negotiate a divorce. I think the division of assets should be pretty straightforward. The house only has a small mortgage. Once that is paid off, we will split the proceeds. Our investments, savings, and current accounts will be split. Amanda's college fund will remain untouched. There will be no alimony since you'll be living with the asshole sitting there. Now both of you please leave. Cindy was crying to the point of tears as Ronnie took her hand. Walking to the door, Cindy turned to me and said, If you change your mind, I love you very much. I want you in my life. As soon as they left, the silence of the house came over me. I felt empty inside, but my years on the force had taught me stamina. I put the wound in the box and closed the lid. Then I went to my office and started making a list of what I needed to do. I knew exactly what kind of lawyer I was going to get. Her name was Sally Leone. She had a reputation as a real shark in divorce proceedings. She usually represented wives, and the poor husbands never knew what hit them. Over the years, our paths crossed. I helped her many times when needed. I looked over the list and realized there was one thing I hadn't done yet. I need to call Amanda and let her know what's going on. It broke my heart to have to tell my little girl what her mother was doing. It took Amanda a full five minutes to calm down so I could truly understand her. What happened next was a surprise. That damn whore did this to you, Daddy, she said venomously. All these years you've been so good to her to us, and now she's stabbing you in the back. If she does that, I want nothing to do with her. Amanda, I said calmly. You're very upset right now, and I understand how you feel. But Cindy is your mother, and she loves you unconditionally. Don't ruin your relationship with your mother over this. We'll all lose if you do. Can't you at least wait a few days before you talk to her? What if she calls me? Amanda asked. If she does, I'll give her the full story. Please, if she calls, don't answer for a few days. Promise me you'll do that. Amanda reluctantly agreed to honor my request. Later that night, Cindy called me very concerned. She had tried to call Amanda but was unable to. 
I explained that I had spoken to her and our daughter was obviously upset. I explained to Cindy that Amanda wanted to calm down before talking to either of us about the subject. I bet you turned her against me, Cindy accused me. I bet you painted the most disgusting picture you could. Cindy, how can I paint a worse picture than you've already painted? I said calmly, knowing it would make her angry. Her mother wants her father to let her sleep with another man. Before Cindy could say anything, I decided to tackle one of the items on my list. Oh, now that I have you on the line, you should hire a lawyer. Please, Ted, don't do this, she cried again. It's killing me that you want me out of your life. I love you so much. Can't you give in to me a little? There's nothing to discuss, Cindy, I said, and hung up the phone. I took the next week off to focus on getting all the ducks in a row. But the nights were horrible. Lying in bed alone was unbearably lonely. I would wake up in the morning and reach for Cindy, only to remember why she wasn't there. The first thing I did was call Sally, but I was unpleasantly surprised when she told me that Ronnie had already called her. That bastard was secretive. He must have already figured out who the best divorce lawyer was, and now he was ahead of me. Well, if I can't hire you, I said, somewhat offended, can you recommend someone I should hire? I said Ronnie contacted me. Sally snorted. I didn't say he hired me. In fact, I told him you'd already hired me. Wow, I said with great relief. I really appreciate you doing this. Ted, most men in this town think I'm a piece of shit, she said bitterly. You're one of the few who has always treated me with respect. You're one of the few who has tried your best to help me. I've always appreciated that. There's no way I would ever turn against you. Again, I'm very grateful. You'll still have to pay my fee, she said with a laugh. I really appreciate you, but I have to pay for the lights, too. It's not a problem, Sally, and thanks again. Even days later, the phone conversation between Cindy and Amanda didn't go well. According to both, it degenerated into a shouting match with ugly names thrown back and forth. Cindy called me afterward almost hysterical that she had lost her daughter forever. I told her I'd talk to Amanda and try to work things out, but it turned out to be much harder than I could have imagined. Amanda was angry when I spoke to her a week later. According to my daughter, she told her mother that she wanted nothing to do with her. Cindy would not be invited to the prom or wedding, and if she had grandchildren, she would never meet them. Now I understood why Cindy was hysterical. The calls from Cindy continued until the day of the divorce. She kept begging me to reconsider and accept their plan. I, of course, continued to refuse. After the divorce, the calls stopped and I tried to move on. Thank goodness I had a job. As chief of detectives, my schedule was pretty flexible. Over the next six months, I became much more hands-on. I was often able to point some of my new detectives in the right direction. That way, they didn't waste any time descending into obvious dead ends. I also began to review our unsolved cases. As a result of my efforts, we were able to close a long-forgotten murder case. It turned out that the victim's ex-boyfriend had done it. They always had the evidence, but they just didn't see it. For that, I got a commendation and a raise. Cindy and Ronnie got married about a month after the divorce. They wanted to buy my half of the house, but the thought of Ronnie living in my house turned me inside out. Ronnie threatened to go to court to force me to sell it. I told him to go ahead and sue. I was friendly with all the appraisers in town, and when I explained my dilemma, they all agreed to help. The appraisals were much higher than the house was worth, yet Ronnie didn't care. He paid a ridiculously high price for my house. It pissed me off, but there was nothing I could do about it. In the end, though, I liked the result. I got a lot more money out of the sale than I could have. The divorce went better than I thought it would. I have Sally to thank for that. Her analysis was so thorough that she found information that helped me. The down payment on the house was inherited from my grandfather. Thus, the amount was not considered community property. As a result, I received about 75% of the sale proceeds. With that money, I bought myself a cash apartment not far from work. Life goes on, but I'd be lying if I said it didn't hurt. All those years with Cindy, and here she decided I wasn't enough. I tried to go back to the dating scene, but... It was even more depressing. Most of the women I dated came with a ton of baggage. Some of them were just plain intimidating, and almost all of them desperately wanted to get married. I, on the other hand, wasn't interested in marriage. I'd been down that road before. 
One night, about eight months after Ronnie and Cindy's wedding, I was having dinner at a restaurant. I didn't realize they were there until Cindy sat down. I was surprised to see my ex-wife, but decided I wasn't going to be nasty. I looked around and saw Ronnie sitting at a table at the other end, studying the menu. How are you doing, Ted? Cindy asked quietly. I'm doing fine, I replied with a sad smile. How are you doing? I still miss you every day, she said, placing her hand on top of mine. I still love you very much. If you ever find it in your heart to accept Ronnie, I'd love to be with you again. At first I was going to pull my arm out from under her and tell her to go for a walk, but then an idea hit me. I'd have to talk to Amanda first, but it might be something I could do to get back at that asshole, Ronnie. I miss you too, Cindy, I admitted honestly. I hate waking up and you're gone, but you're a married woman now. By the way, I think your husband is looking for you. Cindy looked at Ronnie and he was looking at her with a what-the-hell expression. She just nodded to her husband and stood up. Remember, I still love you. That same night I called Amanda and explained what I wanted to do. At first she was horrified and told me I was giving in to this slut. Then I explained why I wanted to do it and she started giggling. The giggling turned to laughter. That's just great, Daddy, Amanda finally said. Go for it. The next day I called Cindy with my daughter's blessing. I told her I wanted to talk to her and Ronnie. I told her I was thinking about our conversation yesterday. Cindy was thrilled, and we agreed to meet at our old house at seven o'clock that evening. I arrived at seven sharp. Cindy led me into the living room. It was disheartening to see him sitting on the couch in my former home. However, I took some satisfaction in the annoyed expression on his face. It was clear to me that Cindy had blamed this meeting on Ronnie at the last minute. He glared at me like a dagger. I pretended not to notice anything. After pouring us each a cup of coffee, Cindy settled on the couch between Ronnie and me. I got right to the point. Cindy, what did you mean when you said the offer to share still stands? A smile appeared on Cindy's face. Yes, absolutely. The offer still stands. I told you that I still love you deeply. It's just that I love Ronnie, too. Well, if you agree, I said, trying to feign nervousness, I'd say yes. I don't have anyone right now. At least this way I'll have you part of the time. I've been so lonely without you. Cindy rushed over to me. She kissed me as passionately as we had never kissed before. Oh, Ted, you've made me the happiest woman in the world. Wait a minute, Ronnie said, standing up. We haven't discussed this yet. It's the same thing you suggested, I told Ronnie calmly. Yes, but still, Cindy, you and I need to discuss it first. Ronnie was very excited. We've already discussed it, Cindy said, a little surprised by Ronnie's objection. When did we discuss it? Ronnie blushed. Don't forget, we discussed it before we presented Ted with the plan. You said you were more than willing to share. Ronnie was discouraged by his own words, and there was nothing he could do about it. Still, he wasn't going to give up so easily. I still think we need to talk about it. The thought of pointing out to Ronnie what a hypocrite he was was on my tongue. It was the same deal he'd offered me, but now the shoe was on the other foot. He was the husband, and I was the ex. However, I decided to let this drama play out between Cindy and Ronnie without my involvement. Okay, I'll leave and wait to hear from you, Cindy, I said, kissing her before leaving. Once back in the car, I started laughing my ass off. I had switched roles with this asshole. Now he was wriggling like a worm. I wish I had been a fly on the wall that night. The next day, I got a call from Cindy saying that Ronnie was very upset, but when she told him she was going to leave, he agreed. Cindy would spend one week with me and one week with Ronnie. Of course, at Ronnie's insistence, none of this could be done until I was tested for STDs. I agreed on the condition that they both get tested as well. Cindy didn't object, but Ronnie was not happy. As it turned out, we were all clean. The next week, I stopped by to pick up Cindy. Cindy looked good when she came to the door. Ronnie, on the other hand, looked like he had murder on his mind. I grabbed Cindy and kissed her hard. Then I grabbed her two suitcases and we walked out. I decided that I would do everything I could to make this night special. I took her out to dinner and then to the dance. Then we went back to my apartment. I want you inside me, she whispered hoarsely. When you're inside me, I know you still love me. I loved Cindy, but not enough to want her to be my wife again. We lay there and cuddled until I fell asleep. The week went by quickly and very pleasantly. I had to work, so I told Cindy that she could go home for the day if she wanted. 
Cindy was adamant she was my wife for the week. That made me cringe inwardly. But hell, if that's what she wanted to believe, that was fine with me. All I was interested in was fucking Ronnie's wife. She cleaned the house, went grocery shopping, washed my clothes, cooked meals, and even set our dinner times. I had a blast. I even got Amanda to talk to her mother without yelling at her. Of course, Amanda was aware of my plan, and I'm sure she laughed at how clueless her mother was. As I drove Cindy home, Ronnie looked both pleased and angry. Whatever anger was simmering inside him, he kept it in check. He kissed Cindy passionately right in front of me. I just pecked Cindy on the cheek, said, I love you, and left. For the next three months, our new agreement was honored. I have to say, for me, this arrangement was great. Fucking Cindy after the divorce was a hit, especially since it was her suggestion. I was now getting laid six or seven times a week. Another benefit of this new arrangement was that I convinced Amanda to come home and spend some time with us. I'm not sure if my daughter did this because she missed her mother or if she was making fun of her. One day, maybe two months after this new arrangement began, I was checking on my three detective teams working different crime scenes. Just then, a call came over the radio about a disturbance at Mick's Tavern. Since I was only a block away from there, I decided to check it out for myself. When I got there, I found that there had been an altercation with a drunken customer. I was surprised to find out that the drunk was Ronnie. I decided to take care of the problem. After letting the two officers go, I turned to Ronnie. Come on, Ronnie, I said, taking his hand. I'll take you home. I don't need your fucking help. Ronnie, your choice is either I take you home or you go to jail. What's better for you? He decided to take the ride home. All the way to my old house, we didn't say a word. When he got out of my car, all he said was, fuck you. By the fourth month, Ronnie was less and less happy about our arrangement. He and Cindy argued about it more and more. He wanted it to stop, but Cindy couldn't understand why. I didn't interfere in their discussions. I just kept telling Cindy that she was wonderful and continued to get all the sex I wanted for a week. This arrangement allowed me to sleep with her much more than when we were married. Finally, when I came to pick up Cindy for a week, about five months after our agreement, things came to a boil. Ronnie and Cindy were yelling at each other in the yard. I decided to try to calm them down. I think you guys should calm down, I said with a smirk, or someone will call the police. Fuck you, Ronnie threw angrily before turning to Cindy again. If you go with him, then our relationship is over. We had a deal, Ronnie, she said with a nasty note in her voice. Since I've known Ronnie, I've never seen my ex-wife speak to her new husband with anything other than affection. The agreement is bullshit, Ronnie yelled. And I'm telling you again that if you go with him, it's over. You can't be serious, Cindy said in a dismissive tone. You were the one who came up with the idea of the exchange a long time ago. With those words, Ronnie stormed into the house and slammed the door shut. I looked at Cindy questioningly. He's just having a bad day, Cindy said, taking my hand. He'll get over it and everything will go back to normal. Things didn't go back to normal. Apparently, Ronnie had moved out. Cindy tried to talk to him, but he was adamant. They were done. Around noon on Wednesday, Cindy called me and told me what had happened. He left me, Ted, she said, sobbing. Can I move in with you? Yes, I'll be at your place on Monday when it's time for my regular week, I said cheerfully. But Ronnie's gone, Cindy said, confused. I want to come back to you completely. I realize I made a huge mistake. Everything Ronnie said about sharing was just bullshit to keep us apart. I want things to go back to the way they were. Well, you see, Cindy, I said, feigning embarrassment. You wanted me to share you. You didn't want me to work full time. So I'm used to you being just a part-time wife. I don't think that's changed with Ronnie gone. So you still want me to pick you up on Monday? Cindy started sobbing uncontrollably, and silence followed. For a moment, I thought she had hung up, but the bitter sobbing resumed. Finally, after several attempts, Cindy regained her speech and stammering said, Yes, yes, please, Ted, I'd really like it if you'd pick me up on Monday. 